The ancient story begins. Then listen, Socrates, to a tale which, though strange, is certainly true, about a great and wonderful empire where an advanced civilization once lived, Atlantis. Did it exist, or was the Greek philosopher Plato, who wrote these words, just telling a tale? Over 2,000 years later, philosophers are skeptical. But those who believe in Atlantis say they have new evidence of its existence. Clues in Plato's own words leading them not only to the location of the lost continent, but to survivors. The Greek philosopher Plato introduced the world to the lost continent of Atlantis around 360 BC. He described a utopia that vanished in a single day and night to lie buried somewhere under the sea. His words became more than a story to explorers enchanted by the idea of finding a lost continent. There are currently five expeditions underway in five completely different parts of the world. Each group is confident that it will be the one to find Atlantis. It seems when Plato wrote his story, he unwittingly left a set of clues. Clues such as, it was an island situated in front of the Straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Hercules. The island was larger than Libya and Asia combined. From these you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent, which surrounded the true ocean. Each group believes it has correctly deciphered them. That five groups of people have come to such different interpretations of the same clues is, like all mysteries, the intriguing part of this story. Most mainstream scientists decided long ago that Atlantis was nothing more than a myth. People who who spend their lives trying to understand Plato, uh, none of them think that this is anything other than his own free invention from his own immensely fertile imagination. But Atlantis researchers believe Atlantis did exist. And if they give up the search, they not only give up finding an important link to our past, but uncovering the secrets of an advanced civilization. You know, other cultures that were described as myth, such as Homer's Troy, were found to have an actual location, as Heinrich Schliemann did in the late 19th century. He discovered the actual Troy in five levels of construction, going back thousands of years. Of course, he was laughed at and scorned and criticized, but he turned out to be right. And then there's this. Plato emphasized in his writings that his story of Atlantis was fact, not fiction. Those who searched for it have taken him at his word. If only Plato had been as clear in his description of where the lost continent was. To many, the most logical place to look for Atlantis is Greece, where Plato grew up. But some Atlantis researchers have focused their attention in the Caribbean or they say many of Plato's clues seem to apply here. For one thing, he said Atlantis was in the Atlantic Ocean. This is the story of two of those expeditions, one involving an anthropologist who is looking for clues of Atlantis survivors in the ancient sculptures of the Yucatan Peninsula. The other, a psychologist and counselor, trying to find evidence of the lost continent in the Bahamas. They have their work cut out for them, if Atlantis did exist, its location has been well hidden by time, sand and water over the past 11,000 years. The story of Atlantis is of a great empire where people lived in paradise. It was a land with lush vegetation.
Animals of every kind, palaces of gold and ivory and silver, where an advanced society created its own electricity, hot and cold running water, and navigated the waters of the world before becoming corrupted by its own power. Doctors Greg and Laura Little know the story of Atlantis as well as anyone. Plato's clues and the work of others who preceded them have convinced the husband and wife team to focus their search for the lost continent in the Bahamas. Though they are reluctant to say they are looking for Atlantis. We crawled up and down and I saw them. Most researchers are reluctant to say that they're looking for Atlantis because Atlantis has been assumed to be a fantasy, a, a legend. American mainstream archaeology asserts there was no Atlantis, but the actual fact is they make that assertion because no one like us has come forward with absolute proof that they accept. The Littles are on a mission to find enough evidence to convince mainstream archaeologists to at least consider the possibility. Of the five expeditions currently underway, the Bahamas hold the most viable evidence of Atlantis, simply because it's been explored by the most people over the longest period of time, almost 40 years. The strongest evidence so far is a 1,600-foot stone formation off the island of Bimini, called the Bimini Road, a structure that seems to have been laid out stone by stone in a design. Those who believe the Bahama Islands were once part of Atlantis think the Bimini Road could have been a breakwater, enclosing a harbor of the capital city, Poseidon, where Atlanteans docked their ships in between voyages around the world. The road was discovered by a pilot in 1968. Core samples of the stones in the road were taken by a geologist in the 1970s who concluded, much to the Atlantis researchers' dismay, that they were natural beach rock. They have written that you can find it all over. We have looked all over. We've never found any natural beach rock where you have row upon row of huge squares and rectangles of beach rock. In 36 years of searching the Bahamas, explorers have also found fluted marble columns, stone slabs and walls, much like those at ancient sites like Stonehenge, and large formations, 500 to 1,000 feet in diameter, in the shape of geometric figures and letters that have no explanation, except that someone put them there. On one of their first expeditions, the Littles decided to investigate the formations and found them to be nothing more than turtle grass. Interesting formation of and sponge, but mainly sea. Part of what you learn to do uh, with scientific research is, is just find the result. It doesn't matter whether the result is positive or negative, it's still a result. It's still important. So whether these ended up being man-made or we still found out what's true about these particular formations and that's what's of interest to us. We're not trying to prove Atlantis or disprove Atlantis. We just want to know what these things are. We're not going to prove Atlantis with a piece of pottery. And we're not going to prove Atlantis with a point or an arrowhead. We're looking for structures. We're looking for real stone walls, a real stone building, and no one will question it once they see the evidence. That's what we're looking for. In 2003, the Littles found something, a hundred miles away from the Bimini Road, off the largest of the Bahama Islands. We're going to go from Morgan's Bluff around the tip of northeastern Andros down to Nichols Town, and there's a tiny bay at Nichols Town, which is our main point of interest. In that tiny bay, a dive operator led them to a structure he'd never seen until that year. Keep it under two knots, if you will. Greg had a drop camera that helped them in their search. It's a small camera wired to a video, a bit like NASA's rover looking for images on Mars. Come here, we'll take a look, too. From these stark pictures, Greg was able to see what was beneath the boat. It wasn't a typical ocean floor, but a layer of rock as far as he could see. A structure that, upon closer inspection, looked similar to the Bimini Road, but much larger. 
They called it the Andros platform. 25.08 north and 78 west. Yeah, turn and go a little further out. Murky. They believe the platform was hidden under sand for centuries until Hurricane Andrew blasted through in 1992. We checked it out back in the spring of 2003, and we've gone back at least five times since then and uh, trying to sort of map the site. When the Littles discovered the platform in 2003, they documented their discovery. This is their footage. Initially, we were skeptical, but once you see uh, several of the stones together, uh, it's obvious that it's not a natural thing for the, the uh, breaks to be at such consistent intervals. The rocks do seem to be laid out in a straight line, and from this video, it appears that there are seams in between them. The total length, as best as we can tell, is about 400 yards. Uh, in some areas, it appears to be fairly continuous, and it's about 150 feet wide, three sections or three tiers of about 50 feet each. There's a lot of areas that have been covered with sand, and every time we come, there's different areas that are covered with sand, of course. We're not geologists, but from what we've seen, uh, the portions of the platform that we've seen look very much man-made because the, the intervals are so consistent between the blocks. The rocks and seams were easy to see then. They're hoping almost two years later that the platform will still be intact. But there's some anxiety about what they'll find on this trip. There's a lot more sand than I've ever seen. Hurricane Jean swept through this region in 2004. They have no idea if it uncovered more of the platform or covered it back up with sand. Hold on for a second, just idle for a moment. They know approximately where the structure so is, sand. but it's a big ocean. Greg uses the drop camera again to try to locate the main part of the structure. And that is about where it was, yeah, that's it. Once he finds it, they snorkel the area to get an overview. Then, while Laura films from the surface, Greg scuba dives to get a close-up. It was uncovered in 1992 by Hurricane Andrew, and now here in 2004, it's been recovered by Hurricane Jean. It's disappointing. Totally covered. But they'll be back. Sooner or later, somewhere down here, we will find some real definitive evidence. If Atlanteans once docked their ships in this bay, they would have had easy access to the waters of the world. Their voyages would have taken them to lands that would hold an important place in their future. Lands still lost in time, with their ancient secrets and haunting mysteries. Two thousand four hundred years ago, the Greek philosopher Plato introduced the world to the lost con of the ancient emit and enticing explorers began a search to find it and uncover its secrets author and anthropologist george erickson has been looking for evidence of atlantis in the yucatan peninsula and other parts of south america for the past 25 years this is the major temple or templo at tulum he's not interested in finding remnants of the lost continent like so many others He's looking for evidence of survivors. In the book he co-authored with Professor Ivar Zapp, Atlantis in America, Navigators of the Ancient World, Erickson argues that some Atlanteans survived the destruction of their continent and found refuge in South and Central America. Erickson's theory is based on his interpretation of Plato's clues and his own theory of where Atlantis was. What's existing now that was part of Atlantis is the Yucatan Peninsula, except it would have extended another 150 miles to the north. Cuba, except it would be twice its present size. The Bahamas, except instead of a, many islands, you would have one great bank, the Bahamas Bank. 11,500 years ago, that entire area was above sea level. The popular explanation for why Atlantis can't be found is that it was sunk 
11,500 years ago by a massive earthquake that buried it under thousands of feet of water. But there's a growing theory among those who search for the lost continent that it was something much more devastating. There was some sort of a massive disaster that occurred, probably involving a fragmenting comet, and it literally destroyed all the life, and it destroyed the evidence of civilization on all these islands. This is the way both Ericsson and the Littles, who've never met, believe Atlantis was destroyed. For days before the destruction, Atlanteans would have been watching the sky to guide them in their voyages around the world. What they saw was different than the usual stars, something much brighter. The animals would have been uneasy, sensing something. Suddenly, the sky filled with light. And then, destruction. In one day, the mighty empire of Atlantis was engulfed. While astronomers generally don't like to get involved in the topic of Atlantis, Dr. Mark Hammergren of the Adler Planetarium in Chicago agreed to talk about the likelihood of a comet destroying Atlantis. Uh, when we look at uh, the geological record, uh, which is really pretty good, dating back to about 11,000 years ago, that's just the blink of an eye in geology, we find no evidence for a very large impact, something that could have devastated a small country. Dr. Hammergren says it comes down to this. If Atlantis had been destroyed by an asteroid, there wouldn't have been any Atlanteans left to tell their grandchildren about it. Well, see, this is a, a real problem with this uh, Atlantis theory, that the impact was large enough to completely obliterate the island, to blast it so much off the face of the Earth uh, that it is entirely beneath the sea now. How do you reconcile having an impact big enough to do that and still leave survivors who were anywhere around the, the line of sight. George Erickson has a different theory. He believes there were a number of Atlanteans who not only survived, but left proof. The evidence, he says, is in Plato's writings. And here in the mysterious Mayan ruins of the Yucatan Peninsula, where he believes some surviving Atlanteans migrated after the destruction of their homeland. Ericsson is convinced that these ruins were not originally built by Mayans, but Atlantis. This, he says, Atlantis once looked like. He points to four key pieces of evidence to support his theory. Firstly, Mayan versus Atlantean building styles. We have evidence that this has been built five different times tear down this structure to go to the earlier ones, but each one may have been more perfect than the other or may have been less perfect. What we often find in the Mayan world is that the oldest structures are the most perfect. They're closer to the time of Atlantis. Secondly, images of elephants on buildings. Plato said there were elephants on Atlantis. There were no elephants in Central America during the Mayan reign one to 3,000 years ago. Mainstream science has explained elephant figures like this as a stylized macaw, a parrot-like bird. But this is not a parrot-like figure. This is the trunk of an elephant. Thirdly, sculptures of what appear to be men with mustaches. Throughout the Maya lands, we have examples of men with square jaws and with definite beards, often with accompanying mustaches. The Maya people did not have facial hair. And finally, Buddhist and Negro sculptures in the ruins prove foreign travelers visited the Yucatan through Atlantis's navigational corridor. Plato repeatedly described Atlantis as an island continent that connected the oceans to the other continents of the world. And this is exactly what the center of the Americas does. But Gary Feynman, curator of the Department of Anthropology at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, believes what Erickson sees as proof of Atlantean survivors can be explained. The Mayans changed their style of building through the centuries. 
what look like sculptures of men with moustaches are Mayan supernatural figures. There is no conclusive proof of ancient foreigners in the Yucatan. And what look like elephant trunks are once again supernatural figures, this time with long noses. If there is to be a radical reinterpretation of the Maya, then it seems to me that the burden of the evidence sits with those people who want to overturn decades of archaeological work and thought, and they ought to have a lot of evidence behind those opinions. Uh, and, and I just don't see it. Scientists estimate that only 10% of the Yucatan ruins have been excavated. Temples still covered by centuries of foliage may hold other evidence to put the argument of who built these ruins to rest. But the mystery of Atlantis will continue. In the early 20th century, the Atlantis story became even more surreal and mysterious when a modern day Nostradamus told the world he'd seen the lost continent in dreams and he knew exactly where to find it. As if Plato's clues to the location of Atlantis weren't enough of a mystery, during the first half of the 20th century, another twist to the story surfaced. A modern-day visionary named Edgar Cayce told the world he had visions of the lost continent and he knew exactly where to find it. He said the advanced civilization had mastered surgery with a laser beam, had ships that sailed in the air and under water, created gases that allowed them to lift heavy stones to build temples, and had a powerful crystal that harnessed energy from the sun to provide Atlanteans with light, heat, and electricity. His vivid descriptions of the lost continent were spellbinding. In the early 1920s, he had some people come to him who wanted to ask some other questions. They decided that if he was so accurate in being able to diagnose people from a distance and, and if he had access to some deeper universal knowledge that maybe he could, could tell more about uh, philosophy or, or uh, the creation of the world or, or give a little bit more information. To many people of the 1930s and 40s, Casey was a modern-day Nostradamus. Casey made hundreds of accurate predictions about the First and Second World Wars, the stock market crash, and India's independence. His prophecies about Atlantis are his most popular. Like Plato, Casey gave future explorers his own set of clues to the location of Atlantis. He prophesied that parts of Atlantis would be discovered in the late 1960s. The Bimini Road was discovered in 1968. Casey died in 1945, but his vision has lived on in his organization, the A.R.E. Edgar Casey Foundation. For 36 years, A.R.E. has funded explorations to find evidence of the lost continent. The Littles are the current lead researchers of the A.R.E.'s Search for Atlantis project. One of the things we do is, is keep up with what's going on currently in archaeological research. We also take trips like this uh, to just kind of scope out what's, what some of these particular sites are that have been funded in the past and if there's any potential for future research. They work primarily on Andros Island, where they found a large underwater structure they call the Andros Platform in 2003. What really uh, makes the case for the Andros platform are several other factors. One is there are three tiers where beach rock stones, giant stones, sit on top of other beach rock stones. Natural beach rock doesn't do that, and they actually get higher as you go into deeper water. Natural beach rock doesn't do that either. The Littles believe the platform, like the Bimini Road, might have once been a breakwater where Atlanteans docked their ships in between long voyages. 
I have contacted some geologists about that particular area, some rather well-known geologists, not the ones that have worked before in these areas. I'd like totally fresh people. When they get a chance to go in and look, they will. But their big problem is funding. I, I mean, that's the truth. Funding is a major problem. While they wait, they continue to investigate other possible clues of Atlantis. On their last visit, they decided to look into a story about an underwater cave discovered in the 70s. It's what's supposedly inside the cave that's the interesting part of this investigation. The researcher who found it in 1973, Herb Sawinski, said he took this photograph of hieroglyphics on one of the cave walls. Was it authentic? He was skeptical. But if it is, this could be just the evidence the Littles are looking for. But on the way to the location Sawinski described to the Littles, motor failed. It demanded extreme measures. Even the camera crew was called into action to get the rapidly drifting boat a safe distance from shore and the crew to high ground. Still, they were only a short distance from the reported cave site. So it would be in this sandy part here. And the Littles quickly found a helping hand. There was one there? A local who used to dive in a hole on the beach that had underwater caves. That's right. Ah, uh, the, the disappearing blue hole. Uh, or the about where Mickey's standing yeah. now, where this... Little for you, little for you. Did you ever go in? I used to dive in that. Yeah? A few years ago, it used to come and go. Yeah. Come and go. Still full of sand and then wash out later, right. is that it? Yeah. Right, Could you walk us to it and show us about where it was? But we used to fish in it, you know, right in this area. So somewhere right here, for sure. In that area. I can't directly see you. Right, because it's... As I come in. Fine. Well, I really, really appreciate right. it. More than... Okay. More than you know. Yeah? But that's a... Definitely a... A hole. The digging began. But the Littles weren't prepared for a land dig. They thought from their research that the cave was in the ocean. Yeah, there's, there's holes there's here. There's air bubbling up attached to it. But the local story has inspired them. There might be a blue hole straight out. Attached. This whole island is a labyrinth. Okay. The whole island is a labyrinth. We got a hole, Mick. Got a hole? Yes, sir. Caves aren't unusual. Mick, did we bring a rope with us? Uh, no. But it's the carvings in the caves here that would be very unusual. And isn't it just a... If this is the only bros, it would be right here. Don't break that thing on me. Yeah, it's pretty weird here. Yeah. Beach rock is soft. After an hour of digging, it was obvious that makeshift tools were inadequate to the task. If this was the cave where hieroglyphics were found, they were not going to find it on this expedition. That's it. Disappointed, yeah, in a way. Um, but if it had been easy to find, if this had really been easy to find, somebody would have already found it and reported it. Sure, we're disappointed. However, what we found on all of these trips is that what seems to be bad luck oftentimes turns into good luck. You just have to be patient. And who knows, on our next trip, maybe the one that'll do it. There was one more piece of the puzzle to be followed up on Andros this trip. Two years ago, the Littles met a 96-year-old local who claimed he lived on an ancient site where a temple once stood. A temple that from his description might have looked very much like those of the Mayan ruins in the Yucatan. This site's of interest to us for a couple of reasons. One is, is that it does appear that it predates what traditional archaeology says were the first people that were here. The other thing is, is that it really fits our theory. And the theory is that there was an Ice Age era maritime culture that actually was in the whole Caribbean and in the Gulf 
Uh, North Andros would have been a port sort of on the outer edge. Bimini well could have been a port on the outer edge. Central Andros, there would, this would be the ideal place for another port. This would be an ideal place for them to stop. And this is such a great lookout. They could see anything in the deep water channel out here. The stories of ancient navigators and their homeland in the middle of the ocean had been passed down from generation to generation from the Bahamas, the United States, to the Yucatan. There are even those who believe descendants of Atlantis continue to walk the earth. History lurks deep in the Yucatan Peninsula, hundreds of feet below the Earth's surface. In June 2002, filmmaker and diver Wes Skiles found something when he was diving here. Unbelievable what, what's down there. It's just beyond imagination. I've dove places all over the world and caves all over the world, but to go down in this capsule of well-preserved artifacts. It gave me instant chills because lying down all around the bottom are these bones and bodies. And I was like, my gosh, you know, what, what happened here? After Skiles contacted Mexican scientists, he led a team like this one to take a closer look. Like divers, scientists are used to diving in these cenotes. They study them for clues to the Yucatan's history. Some archaeologists believe humans walked in these seemingly bottomless pits before the Ice Age flooded them. But in cave diving, a diver can never be too confident. The team had to wind its way through water-filled caverns like these, with nothing but darkness in front of them. Some cave openings were so tight, they had to take off their tanks and equipment to squeeze through. Time was also a factor. Divers had just 40 minutes to get to the cave, 20 to work there, and 40 more to swim back before their air ran out. But the discovery they made would ultimately prove worth the risk. In the depths of the remote cenote, they found a well like this the first fully articulated skeleton ever found in the cenotes. It was a major discovery, but there was even more to come. On additional expeditions, scientists would find other skeletons in other cenotes. Two years later, radiocarbon dating tests would reveal their ages. Some of the skeletons were 8 to 13,000 years old around the same age as the Kennewick man found in Washington state. Though they looked like these skeletons, they were among the oldest skeletons ever found in the Americas. At least 5,000 years too old to be Mayan. Scientists call them pre-Clovis. Author and anthropologist George Erickson calls it the time of Atlantis. Erickson believes these savers of Atlantis. This skull is dociocephalic. It is long-faced. It's not a round skull with a flat face, as we would expect from a Paleo-Indian. It is possibly European, but much more likely it is a member of, of the peoples who were here 10,000 years ago, after the demise of Atlantis. For Erickson, it all fits. A 10,000-year-old skeleton with features that are definitely not those of an early Central American native. Different building styles from the earliest to the most recent Mayan ruins. Ancient sculptures of men with beards and mustaches. The Mayans didn't have facial hair. Sculptures of people foreign to the Americas 2,000 years ago. These are the pieces of unexplained history that challenge traditional archaeology's view of early civilizations and convince investigators like Erickson that there was not only a continent called Atlantis, but survivors who left their own clues to show us they were here. There is one final piece of evidence 
that George Ericsson believes is perhaps the strongest of all. Legends passed down from one generation of Central and South American natives to another. The Mayan myths describe an arrival by sea for the foundation of civilization. The Inca myths of Contiki and Viracocha describe an arrival by sea for the foundation of civilization. And the Egyptian myths describe Toth coming across the oceans from the west to establish the arts and skills of civilization. It's the same kind of story that University of Veracruz anthropologist Roberto Rodriguez documented in his book Atlantico. Los niños estaban atrapados por aquella maravilla de escuchar esos relatos y del cuidado que se debía tener con la naturaleza. Natives he interviewed told de Professor Veracruz, Rodriguez the story of a society that sank beneath the waves because the gods were upset with their greed. Por aquella maravilla de escuchar esos relatos y del cuidado que se debía tener con la naturaleza. Erickson believes there's truth in such oral legends or myths. Myths could be collective memory of real events, pretty experiences wrapped up in a story that can be told and retold from generation to generation. But Dr. Gary Feynman, curator of the Department of Anthropology at the Field Museum, says there's not enough evidence to change his mind about who built the Mayan ruins. We know that throughout the course of history, civilizations, urban centers rise and fall over and over and over again. That's been a repeated pattern in the history of humankind over the last uh, thousands of years. So that part of the Atlantis, uh, I don't have a problem with. But when you say that that collapse led to the roots of early civilizations across the globe, I think that you're beginning to be on very dangerous ground. The debate between mainstream scientists and those who search for Atlantis won't be over soon. George Erickson isn't budging on his position. The discoveries we're making around the world confirm that there were a very different people in the Americas thousands of years ago. Greg and Laura Little believe there were survivors too. They've written about it in one of their books on ancient civilizations. They're trying to find evidence of possible descendants walking the earth today by using an ancient form of DNA called haplogroup X. Basically what we've done is we have looked at, at all the mitochondrial DNA research that's come out to date in all the 42 known types of mitochondrial DNA, still, even today, haplogroup X is a type of DNA that proved that all Native Americans did not come across the Bering Strait in 9500 BC. The interesting thing to us was that it turned up in the same places that Edgar Cayce said that the Atlanteans migrated. For example, the Basque people, the Iroquois on the eastern shore of North America. There's a little bit in, in Central America, some in South America, and also a little bit in the, in the Middle East as well. As the search for Atlantis continues, an ocean engineer has found what looks like the remains of an ancient city 2,000 feet below the water off the shore of Cuba. The search for Atlantis has been going on for more than a century. Is there a lost civilization buried somewhere under the ocean? The evidence that it did exist is there to the believer, but a mere mirage to scientists. Only Plato knew for sure. I don't think there is any real Atlantis, um, but how do people take generic elements that are combined into a myth and then look around for those generic elements? Well, that's not hard to do. Uh, a thousand years from now, someone may pick up a copy of The Wizard of Oz and then go into Kansas and look for houses which have storm cellars. There's no doubt they'll find a house with a storm cellar in it. They might even find a house where there's a kid named Dorothy living in it. The mistake would then be to extrapolate from that kernel of truth that there had been munchkins, that there had been an emerald city, and so on. 
Yet it's difficult to deny the Emerald City when someone is always finding remnants of scarecrows and tin men. In 2004, a team searching the waters off Cyprus found what they believe are the remains of an ancient city. The location, they say, fits 60 of Plato's clues. Another site getting a lot of interest is off the western coast of Cuba. While looking for sunken shipwrecks with sonar, ocean engineer Paulina Zalitsky and her crew found what looks like an ancient city, 2,000 feet underwater. Cuban archaeologists and anthropologists who've looked at videos of the structures say they've seen symbols and inscriptions. A robotic submersible will be used to get a better look. The site is 90 miles away from the Yucatan, where George Erickson is looking for descendants, and 130 from the Bahamas, where the Edgar Cayce Foundation and the Littles are conducting their search for the lost continent. I'm convinced, as are many others, that Cuba is going to probably hold the key to the whole mystery. It was almost everywhere. That's the problem. It was a maritime island empire, and it probably had a capital which is yet to be found. But an island empire has ports and has cities everywhere. And I think what's being found in coastal India, parts of South America, probably what we're looking at in the Bahamas, what's been found even in the Mediterranean and parts of it, and along Spain and France. I think that's all Atlantis. Probably the city of Atlantis was just a story invented by Plato to prove a point. But buried underwater, there almost certainly are artifacts and sculptures from ancient cities we still know nothing about. If they're not from Atlantis, would that really make them less significant? We don't care what it's called. We don't care if it fits exactly what, what Edgar Casey or Plato says about it. But just were there people traveling worldwide over the oceans at that time? And there's a lot of evidence that they were. I think it's important that we should study ancient cultures. It seems to me um, a terrific thing. Some of our own material prosperity is being used to expand human knowledge. I think Plato would approve of that. But he was telling a morality tale. He coined the term Atlantis. He created this morality tale for a very straightforward purpose in order to talk about what he liked about the real Athens and what he didn't like about the real Athens. Why anyone should think that they should call it Atlantis seems to me incomprehensible. As a scientist, I like to keep my mind open to any possibility. But I have to ask the question, where is the evidence for this? And the only evidence I see is coming from these legends and from Plato's stories. One thing is certain, the search. If the legend of Atlantis is true, and if the legends of the Maya are true, that there is a periodic destruction because of the arrogance of man. We must look to how we're conducting ourselves and realize that we are polluting. We are making an ecological disaster out of the earth on the same lines that the Atlanteans did when Plato said they arrogantly brought about their own destruction. It doesn't matter if Atlantis itself existed or not. What matters is what really happened back then. That's really all that matters, because that was the truth. And that's what we're after, the truth. 